Thank you for considering the Corporate Cowboys podcast. As I narrate Hitman Online, a technical manual for independent contractors. Originally published 1983 by Paladin Press. Written by Rex Farrell. That's a pseudonym, obviously. My name is Alex and I got this warning for you It is against the law to manufacture a silencer without an appropriate license from the federal fucking government. There are state and local laws prohibiting the possession of weapons and their accessories in many areas. Severe penalties are prescribed for violations of these laws. Neither the author, nor the publisher, nor myself, the narrator, assumes responsibility for the use or misuse of information contained in this book slash audiobook. It's for informational and educational purposes only. That being said, this is chapter seven, getting the job done right. Why the prescribed hit went down the way it did. And so it begins. Getting the job done right. At the beginning of this book, you read an account of an actual hit going down. Side note, yeah, that's in uh, part one or part two. You can find those via the podcast channel. Subscribe to Patreon if you want a full backlog of uh, all the episodes available. You can subscribe and uh, send any donations if you'd like to. You're a smart individual. There's links around for PayPal's and Venmo's. Keep this operation nonprofit. That's all going to go towards expenses and legal fees. At the beginning of this book, you read an account of an actual hit going down. As you probably noted, most of the detail concerning the events covered concerned the efforts to conceal the true identity, avoid public detection, and make sure no incriminating evidence was left behind. The kill is the easiest part of the job. People kill one another every day. It takes no great effort to pull a trigger or plunge a knife. It is being able to do so in a manner that will not link yourself or your employer to the crime that makes you a professional. Public assassinations are sometimes necessary but are messy and draw immediate attention. Quiet, one-on-one confrontations are much to be preferred, especially when your skills and expertise give you a distinct advantage in the situation. Why did our hitman choose to fly and rent a car when other methods of transportation were available? Why go to all the trouble? I think it's why go through all the trouble. Why go to all the trouble of using... Why go to all the trouble to use fucking... I mean, just a reminder, because this is an online manual. It's been uh, authored and published and edited down to uh, PDF format, so... Bear with me if there are any typos or grammatical errors. Why go through all the trouble to use elaborate disguises and keep changing false identifications? Why register at the motel for only two days and pay cash in advance? Why let an incompetent desk clerk get away with overcharging him for food and improperly preparing his order? I don't think that's how it went down. It says, it says here, why let an incompetent desk clerk get away with overcharging him for food and then properly preparing his order? It wasn't a desk clerk. This motherfucker was at a diner. Go back to part one. Listen to that and, and you'll see. So you see, even the author or again, whoever edited it, this, whoever edited, whoever edited this before uploading it uh, didn't, um, didn't just fucked it up somehow and me i'm fucking it up by reading it this way by narrating it this way i could edit it and and proofread it beforehand but i don't think i'd be doing it justice in 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 terms of originality i'd much rather comment on how shitty it is so that uh that way i have some plausible deniability that i didn't write this shit okay okay um, but, 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 and why, and why, after the job was completed and he knew he had plenty of time to make his escape, did he go through so much trouble to dispose of a perfectly good weapon 
disguised and a pair of shoes that he could possibly have used again? Of course, no two jobs will be handled the same, but the following pages will explain why the hitman, in this case, chose to act as the way as he did, chose to act as he did, and why the crime remains unsolved. Yeah, that makes a uh, total sense. No two jobs are the same. You want you want to personalize the jobs. If you have a cookie cutter way of doing a job, you're gonna get fucking popped. Why? Because patterns are patterns by the nature, by the very nature that they're patterns and they're recognizable. Don't get caught lacking by some homicide profiler. Come on now. In some cases, uh, bah, 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 no, that's that's the wrong one. Of course, no two jobs will be handled the same, but the following pages will explain why the hitman in this case chose to act as he did and why the crime remains unsolved. Part 1. Getting there. Your expense money, down payment on the contract, and complete information about the mark is in your possession. Photographs were provided, and enough information is available for you to make a tentative plan for the assault. The information. Study the information sheets. Memorize floor plans, descriptions, and details. Then, if you feel confident that you won't need to refer to the data again, destroy it in a manner that will prohibit restoration. If you feel you may need to carry the data with you to the job site, mail it to yourself and carry the unopened envelope. Every law enforcement, of, even law enforcement officials, should be leery of opening sealed mail without probable cause and the necessary legal documents. Then, just before you leave to complete your assignment, open the envelope, review the contents, and destroy in the manner described above. Uh, I believe the manner was described in part one of the audiobook. That makes it what? Chapter... Chapter two, I believe. No, chapter... Chapter 1 or Chapter 2. Even law enforcement officials should be leery of opening sealed mail without probable cause and the necessary legal documents. Then, just before you leave to complete your assignment, open the envelope, review the contents, and destroy in the manner described above. If something goes wrong as the job goes down, you certainly don't want the authorities to find such incriminating evidence in your possession. Your employer wouldn't appreciate carelessness on your part much either. Uh, yeah, yeah, your employer, I mean, if they're paying you for a job, they could pay somebody else to do you as a job. Makes sense, makes sense. Transportation. The next task to be faced is getting yourself and your equipment to the job site. Any travel agent will be happy to make arrangements for travel, lodging, and a car rental for you at no charge, simply call a travel agency, give a false name, tell the agent your destination, when you want to leave, and ask for an open return flight home. Yeah, so don't don't plan round trips unless you know it's going to be open and shut, you dig? The travel agent will want your phone number to call you back when the information you request is assembled. You can get around giving out your number by telling her you are using a neighbor's telephone or that you're going out for the afternoon and will call her later in the day to get the information. This way, the agent will see your face for only a few brief minutes when you go down to pay cash for your tickets, which will be prepared in the false name you gave. There will be no record of your true identity, phone number, or address, and airlines don't require identification for tickets paid in cash. However, Identification is required for car rental, so don't make such arrangements through a travel agent. Do not make motel reservations in the same name used on your flight tickets. You need not make it any easier than necessary. Yeah, you, you need not make it any easier than necessary for anyone to identify you between your point of departure and the crime scene. So you just want to uh, segment, segment, and distort any points of uh, connection. That makes sense. If for some reason you cannot fly, you may have to drive. 
Trains and buses are much too slow, and the trip would tire you considerably. But, if time permits, train and bus may be the safest method available. In any event, never use your own automobile as a means of getting to the job site. A rental car would work best. Rental car agencies require a valid driver's license and one major credit card as identification even when you pay cash. This is a security measure for them to guard against theft. So if you plan to rent a car even for cash, a fake or stolen set of identification is in order. Make sure you get a car with unlimited mileage and a trunk for locked storage. Obviously, your risk factor is greatly increased when you drive. Even a minor violation can place your location at a particular time, so the driver's license you use must match the name on the rental contract just in case. God forbid that you should become involved in an accident. But should any situation occur where your face has been clearly seen, placing you in the area where the hit is to go down, Either cancel the contract immediately or put it off for a while. Your employer will understand and will be grateful for your precautions. When using a rental car, always carry enough cash to cover any major breakdowns that may occur. Even though the agency normally foots these bills, this is a part of the price you pay for anonymity. Sometimes it is good to cover your trail by flying into a large city a few hundred miles from where the hit is to take place. You can rent a car there and travel to the job location. If you choose to travel this way, steal an out-of-state tag while you are out of state. Stolen tags only show up on the police computer of the state in which they are stolen. You will use the tag to replace the rental tag when you go to make the actual hit. In that way, any suspicion or checks on the parked car will not be traced back to the rental agency or to you. Again, segmenting and distancing yourself from any points of contact. Transporting your tools. You can't work without your tools and you can't count on being able to purchase them when you get to where you're going. Even with proper false identification, there may be residency requirements or waiting periods. So you need your own dependable selection of weapons from home. Of course, you'd never get through airport security with a gun on your person. But you can carry one in your luggage if you notify airport personnel in advance and it will be stored in the cargo compartment. Otherwise, you may have some embarrassing questions to answer as that suitcase goes through airport x-ray. But even if you get permission to pack your gun in your luggage, how will you explain that little muffling tube that is attached to the barrel? If time allows, you can ship everything UPS or by bus or common carrier with pickup at the terminal by the addressee under a fictitious name when you arrive. Or you can use express mail, next day arrival guaranteed post office to post office, which may or may not require ID by the addressee, that's yourself, at the time of pickup. However you choose to transport your weapons, pack them well. Use a metal foam-lined box or two or more cardboard cartons packed inside one another as your shipping container. Disassemble guns and other metal parts and roll them in soft cloth newspapers, or clothes you plan to wear on the job. Include extra pairs of rubber gloves and clean work shows. And clean work shows? What the fuck is that? Clean work. Include several pairs of rubber gloves and clean work shoes. Unless you plan to carry these items with you. If you are driving and for some reason have no choice but to transport these dangerous tools with you in your car, pack well as above and gift wrap or prepare as if for mailing. Carry the wrapped box in the locked trunk of the car out of public view to prevent theft or suspicion. If the package is small enough, it if the package is small enough of it, 
inside a large what? If the package is small enough, put it inside a large suitcase or metal foot locker. Use a combination lock as a double safety precaution on your outer container. Authorities and crooks alike are known for confiscating keys. However, a search warrant with probable cause may be necessary for the authorities to get you to open the combination lock. Note, every item you use on a job should be considered disposable. Then you won't have to worry about how to ship these items home again. Uh, just, uh, yeah, just, just a quick comment. If I'm fucking up on the reading, it's because of typos and grammatical errors. I just have to bring that up. I typically don't proofread these books as I go through. Um, I have before in the past. I feel like that's a little OCD-ish on my part, putting me somewhere on the fucking spectrum. But I don't do that in advance in order to maintain and preserve originality uh, on part of the author or the publisher. If somebody fucks up, I follow through with the fuck up, okay? I'm a professional. <laughs> I'm a professional at fucking up. <laughs> the trip. The trip. You are en route. Your tools on the way via express mail. You are traveling under an assumed name. Everything you purchase is paid for in cash. Anything you buy is a necessity. Food, lodging, transportation. You will use only bills in small denominations, not crisp new $100 bills. You don't want to draw any attention to yourself or become memorable. You are working. This is your job, and you are a professional. You will purchase no gifts or souvenirs, nothing that may point a finger to your locations along the way. This means specifically items like pottery labeled Made in Mexico, shells marked Souvenir of Florida, and the like. You will not become involved with women on any level while you are on assignment. Women have an eerie way of memorizing quickly and in fine detail any man that shows a sexual interest in them. Save pleasure for after business. You will not drink, even socially, nor will you take any drugs or stimulants. If you need artificial courage, you should try some other career. You will not make long-distance phone calls. The phone company computer will be recording the numbers dialed. You will be careful of the food you eat and the water you drink. You don't want a case of food poisoning or dysentery to hamper timely accomplishments of your assignment. You will not draw any unnecessary attention to yourself in any way. You won't over or under tip. You won't be drawn into any memorable conversations. You won't exhibit any rude or argumentative behavior. Your profile will be low and non-disruptive for the duration of the assignment. Though inside you are a wild animal stalking his prey, others may view you as another passive wimp. Let them. If the waiter is too slow, be patient. If the clerk doesn't give back the right change, forget it. If the food is bad, don't eat it. Don't let any little incident cause anyone to remember your face later. Part 2. The Destination The excitement is building as your plane comes in for a landing. Where will you stay? And how will you get there? Unless you know your way around, you can use mass transit... Hold on. Unless you know your way around and can use mass transit to your advantage you will probably need to rent a car. Nothing flashy and in a solid color. Ask for a city map at the rental agency or purchase one at the airport newsstand if one was not provided by the employer. A place to stay is the next priority. It can be any motel, fancy or cheap, but it should be in close proximity to the job site to prevent excessive travel. In fact, if you can find one within walking or jogging distance of the hit, you can forego the car rental and the taxi to the motel, not to the job site. Just don't over or under tip the driver or get into any extensive conversation with them. This is where a disguise can come in handy. Check into the motel using a fictitious name. Identification is not required when you pay cash. 
register for only two days maximum. If you stay is if you stay is to be if your stay is to be longer than two days, change motels and use another name. When you register, use a made up tag number to correspond to the fictitious address you give. If you were in town six days, you will have used five different identities, one for the plane tickets, one for the car rental, and three different names used at three different motels. This should cause some real headaches for anyone trying to pin down your exact location, especially if you keep changing your appearance as you change your name. If you are using a car, keep driving to a minimum. In a strange area, your risks of traffic violations and accidents increase tremendously. Just remember, while you are out to quote-unquote borrow a tag for use when you are ready to make your move. Of course, you will have to call for your you will, of course you will have to call for your equipment if you pre-shipped it to yourself and you will have to drive, jog or stroll past the places your mark is known to haunt. No pun intended. After your how is that a fucking pun? Hold on. And you will have to drive, jog or stroll past the places your mark is known to haunt. No pun intended. It's like, it's like, that's not even setting up a joke for a punchline. That's just like throwing out a punchline and expecting someone to create the joke for you. I mean, and, and obviously the, the joke is that the mark is going to haunt it, is going to haunt it after they're gone. Okay, fine, whatever. After these initial checks, you can determine whether you will stick to your original plan or if changes are in order. Before you leave to do the job, and each time you change motels, you will thoroughly wipe down your room so it will be clean of fingerprints. Make sure you leave no personal items behind that will be proof of your presence. This is a precautionary measure. As you dress for the job, certain precautions should be taken. Clean tennis shoes should be worn during the job because... The ones you wore before may have traces of soil from your hometown, which will leave an important clue for the investigators. The shows don't, the shows, the shoes, it says shows. The shoes don't have to be new, just clean. And since the police can take impressions to ascertain height and weight of the criminal, it doesn't hurt to wear a size larger shoe than normal and even add a weight belt to throw off the investigation. Soft soled tennis shoes are quiet and good for running should the need arise. Clothing, of course, will have to suit the area, particularly if the job is to be done during the day or in a public place. For night work, you can wear your regular clothing under a pair of overalls if the coveralls will not arouse suspicion in the area. Wipe down your weapons as you assemble them. Even the inner parts of your guns must be wiped to remove any prints that were left behind during the last cleaning. Uh, side note, wear gloves when you fucking clean your guns. When you clean your weapons, I'm sorry. It doesn't have to be guns, I suppose. Any weapons. Wipe down each bullet and wear rubber gloves as you load the clip. <clears throat> Comment, uh, it's a magazine. It might be a lot of I don't know, boomers or nerds that listen to the podcast and are going to be like, clip, guns don't fucking take clips anymore or whatever. Yeah, I get it. It's a magazine, but sticking to the authenticity that the author put into the book, you have to wipe down each bullet and wear rubber gloves as you load the clip. Just in case you leave behind an empty cartridge, you don't want your fingerprints emblazoned on the casing. Emblazoned. Nice, nice word. Like that. After loading the clip, discard that pair of gloves. Don't leave them in your room, but throw them away along the way. Handling the clip may have weakened the thin rubber from contact with metal parts. If they are too weak or if just a tiny hole or tear has begun, it might become large enough to leave an incriminating partial print at the scene of the crime. With your luggage and your duffel bag containing your tools in the trunk of your car, the room wiped clean of any clues of your existence, your plan of action firmly in mind, 
you are ready to go. Your knowledge, guts, reflexes, and professionalism will see you through. When the time is right, make your move quietly, efficiently, whatever method you choose. The secret now that the deed is done is to stay in total self-control. Don't panic. Don't hurry. Wait until you know beyond any doubt that you have accomplished your assignment. Check for a pulse at both the wrist and throat. Drag the body out of the line of view of windows and doors so discovery will be delayed. Cover any spots of blood with carefully dropped newspapers or clothing so that too will not be visible or arouse the suspicion of anyone peeking inside. Be absolutely positive that the mark is indeed dead. You do not want to rush out too soon and have to wait around to read the morning paper to see if your mission was successful or read that he survived and sought medical attention. Take a few minutes to carefully survey the scene for any evidence that you might have left behind. Pick up those empty cartridges that were ejected when you fire your gun. Did you remove your gloves for any reason? I hope not, but many a man has been caught because they thoughtlessly removed his gloves after making the kill to help himself to food or drink from the victim's refrigerator. <laughs> That's just hella funny. I guess if you're going to, uh, you know, scarf down a quick sandwich and, and some milk from the fridge, wear your gloves. Obviously, wear your gloves. You know, make sure that shit isn't expired or whatever. I, I, I suppose if you get hungry in the middle of hitting a lick, doing a job, wear fucking gloves. No glove, no love when it comes to the game. If the hit was supposed to look like a burglary, mess the place up a bit and take anything of value that you can carry concealed. Of course, you can't keep anything. These items will have to be ditched along with your work clothes and weapon. But any cash you find is yours to pocket. Excitement made you a bundle of nerves? If nature calls, try to control the urge. One man was actually convicted by the print he left on the victim's toilet seat. It seems he had this scar uh, by the print. It seems he had this scar, maybe a scar on his finger or a scar on his ass cheek. I don't fucking know. If you have to take a piss, flush the toilets with your gloved fingers. You can't imagine how many idiots will remove their gloves to facilitate the operation of the zipper to take a pee. Without thinking, the flush before they, they flush before pulling... The gloves back on. Yeah, I, I guess that's what it says. Without thinking, they flush before pulling the gloves back on. Immediately. <clears throat> Without thinking, they flush before pulling the gloves back on, leaving indisputable evidence to convict them on the flush handle. And believe it or not, the toilet handle is one of the primary sources of prints during the investigation. Check the victim one final time to make sure your part of the contract is complete before you leave the scene. Then make your exit, usually through the front door. If someone sees you casually leaving the victim's house, he has no idea for the reason of your visit or what you have done, and your disguise will conceal your identity. Walk. Don't run to your car or whatever your planned destination might be. The first thing you should do when you reach the car is change into another disguise and get out of those work clothes. Check them for bloodstains. If there are none, you can toss them into a charity collection box or a trash bin. If the victim's blood is on those clothes, they must be burned or buried. Of primary importance now, too, is changing the rifling of the murder weapon. This should be done before you leave the crime scene. That way, even if you get picked up or stopped with the weapon in your possession, its ballistics will not match the bullets you left behind in the mark. Now, move your car to some other location where you will not attract attention as you switch the tags and disassemble your gun. When you are driving, stay calm and obey all traffic rules. Toss your gun parts out at intervals or in various locations around town. Throw them in lakes, 
or waterways. Bury or sink the gun barrel and silencer in different spots. Crush the plastic housing of the disposable silencer before you discard it. The shoes you wore should be discarded as carefully as your weapon. You might have left distinct parts behind that will end up as plaster casts. Uh, just a, yeah, quick commentary. Uh, a plaster cast is essentially just a, a molding of your shoe. So if you left behind shoe prints, they could pour a little bit of plaster into those prints and they could cast what the tread of your shoe looks like. That's what it means here. Toss them separately at intervals along the highway. Ever see a single tennis? To ever see a, a single tennis shoe lying on the road? Yeah, ever see a single... Because it's fucked up how it's written. Ever seen a single tennis shoe lying on the road? Now you know where... Vi where <laughs> I was about to say where violence came from. Now you know from whence it came. Funny. Now you know from whence it came. Hide, bury, burn, toss. But in any event, do away with every tool and article of clothing that was near the scene of the crime, even your rubber gloves. Remember, they may have powder residue on them, and they most definitely have your fingerprints on the inside. If you are flying home, stop and wipe the car for prints, and wear driving gloves as you return the car to the rental agency. If you are driving home, wash the car and vacuum the interior immediately when you arrive at your destination. Remember why you wore clean tennis shoes? Well, foreign soil from the job site is now in the car's interior. It's in the air filter too, so make sure you clean that as well. Sound like a lot of unnecessary trouble and precaution? Perhaps, but it's the overcautious who remain at large. Take, for example, the case of the federal judge slain in Texas in 1978. The contract was for $250,000 and was paid on schedule. The hit was made, fulfilling the contract, but the contractor was soon apprehended. How? Undisguised, this so-called hitman took a taxi to the job site. The taxi driver fingered him. Why? See if you can tell me. Part 3. The Aftermath Getting a Hold on Your Emotions You made it. Your first job was a piece of cake. <laughs> Taking all that money from the job was almost like robbery. Yet, here you are, finally a real hitman with real hard cash in your pockets and that first notch on your pistol. Uh, I doubt it if you disassembled and discarded your pistol, remember? Some people would say that a hitman is an emotionless, cold-blooded killing machine, that he has no fear and no belief in God. On the contrary, a hitman has a wide range of feelings. He may be excruciatingly tender toward his woman. He may be extremely compassionate toward the elderly and disabled. He may have a strong aversion to the useless killing of wildlife. He may even be religious in his own way. What the professional lacks is remorse. He feels no guilt. I'm sure your emotions have run full scale over the past few days or weeks. There was a fleeting moment just before you pulled the trigger when you wondered if lightning would strike you then and there. And afterwards, a short burst of panic as you quickly looked around to make sure no witnesses were lurking. But other than that, you felt absolutely nothing. And you were shocked by that nothingness. You had expected this moment to be a spectacular point in your life. You had wondered if you would feel compassion for the victim, immediate guilt, or even experience direct intervention by the hand of God. But you weren't even feeling sickened by the sight of the body. The first few seconds of nothingness give you an almost uncontrollable urge to laugh out loud. You break into a wide grin. Everything you have been taught about life and its value was a fallacy, a dirty, rotten lie. Life is, life is what? Life is not, you know, beyond, life is now. Um, life is not, I'm assuming, not valuable. A dirty, rotten lie. Life is not. You know beyond a shadow of a doubt that your own life is just as frail and valueless. That makes sense. Okay. 
Everything you have been taught about life and its value was a fallacy, a dirty, rotten lie. Life is not. You know beyond a shadow of a doubt that your own life is just as frail and valueless. What you have done could just as easily and unexpectedly be done to you, despite your fighting ability, your weapons expertise, your efforts to protect yourself. The realization is both sobering and shocking. Like a machine, you do what is necessary to cover your tracks. As you leave the scene, that first burst of cool night air hits you and panic sets in. You have to force yourself to resist the urge to run. It only took 10 minutes to casually stroll to the victim's house. Covering that same distance back to your waiting car seems to take 10 hours. Are people watching you from behind those closed drapes, memorizing your description as they call the police? Can they hear the pounding of your heart above the noise of their television as you struggle to control your breathing and make it even? Once inside the safety of your automobile, you change your clothing and disguise and alter the gun barrel as quickly as possible. Then, both hands gripping the steering wheel, you drive. Your eyes are constantly searching the roadside. You can't afford an accident, traffic violation, or even to miss a turn in your planned route. You struggle to keep the speed of the auto within set limits. Like your feet, your car seems to want to run. With the disposal of each piece of evidence, your fear eases. By the time you arrive at the airport, you begin to feel silly about your unnecessary panic. On your trip back home, you begin to think of the shocking realizations about the real value of life that you experienced after pulling the trigger professionally for the first time. Your own life takes on new meaning. Never again will you strive to accumulate wealth. Instead, you will pack the time you have with the things that make life enjoyable, interesting, and exciting. You will live each day to the fullest. The acceptance of the valuelessness of life has given your own life value. After you have arrived home, the events that took place take on a dreamlike quality. You don't dwell on them. You don't worry. You don't have nightmares. You don't fear ghosts. When thoughts of the hit go through your mind, it's almost as though you are recalling some show you saw on television. By the time you collect the balance of your fee, the doubts and fears of discovery have faded. Those feelings have been replaced by cockiness, a feeling of superiority, a new independence, and a new self-assurance. Your biggest problem now is learning how to deal with your ego. And that concludes Hitman Online, a technical manual for independent contractors, chapter seven. That's the end of chapter seven. And I have to say that the, that the writing is really well done. The writing is really well done. Um, th there are a couple of points. Uh, so far, I've, I've read a couple of points in the, in the manual where the writing is a little... Uh, exaggerative maybe it's a little overstated um but i feel like the ending to this chapter chapter seven was uh monumental monumental momentous if you will because there was definitely a a, a peak a, a, a peak in, in the climat climatic string of events and then it ends with a sheer drop off, a sheer fucking drop off, especially that last paragraph that talks about uh, having a feeling of cockiness when it's all said and done. And the last sentence pretty much lays out the next biggest problem, which is controlling one's ego. I mean, even though uh, the realization of, of how little value life has to some people where they could put a fucking price tag on it, where, where they can put a dollar amount, uh, uh, some some kind of quantifiable figure on it. Even even seeing through that as completely devaluing the essence that is living life. Uh, the biggest problem is learning to deal 
with that newfound, not not even newfound discovery, because if if I feel like if you get into this line of work, you've been knowing it, and you're willing to put a fucking price tag on or accept uh, some amount of of money, some amount of value for taking a life. But yeah, it's just it's just dealing with that ego, um, where if you feel invincible, if you feel superior, if you become cocky, that that minimum price that you set out for yourself, what it, it, it just becomes becomes if the work, if you perceive the work to become easier for you, uh, you might see that that minimum amount go down and uh, sooner or later become reckless with it. And that is something you have to keep in control. I mean, the consummate professional has to be mindful that ego does exist and ego is ego is lethal. Ego is deadly. Having an ego can be fatal. Until next time.